that stretch through the pec, through the lat. Now he actively contracts to add to that stretch shortening cycle. And from here to here, he's closing the gap as fast as he can. What's going on guys, Ben Brewster here at TriFlex.com. Uh, we just released an article written by Graham Lehman on uh, Nate Pearson's, uh, some of his uh, training variables, his physical attributes. Um, so today we're gonna break down his mechanics. Uh, just give you a couple, a couple things that stand out to me. We're not gonna go through all you know, 50 to 60 plus things that we'll look at uh, with our athletes, but just what stands out to me uh, at a glance going through his mechanics. So um, I'm just gonna let this play through, show a couple pitches for those of you who aren't familiar with Nate Pearson. Uh, he's minor leaguer with the Blue Jays. He's been up to 104 miles an hour. Uh, he's a big bodied guy. I believe he's 6'6", 240 plus. Uh, explosive guy for his size. Uh, that was kind of the point of the article uh, that, that was written about him uh, by Graham. So obviously talented, uh, you know, genetically gifted guy, but let's, let's break down what he's doing well from a mechanical standpoint. Let's look at his posture and his position from the back as he gets into his back leg. Let's, let's, let's go here actually, so we get a full, uh, a full throw. So in full speed, during his initial weight shift, what I want you to see is how he stays stacked and centered over his pelvis and over that heel. So you can see where the head is, where the pelvis is, where the heel is. He's rel relatively stacked at this point. He's staying over his center of mass. He's not starting to tip forward with his torso or leak forward onto the toes. Okay, so that's the main thing. He's holding that as he moves forward. So he's staying stacked, he's staying centered, and then he's unloading downhill into landing at the last second. So he's riding that heel, he's riding that hinge, he's keeping his head stacked over the pelvis, and as he rotates, you can see that, that direction of that rotation, it's late, and it's all in the same plane. So the hips unload in this direction, the torso begins to rotate. Same plane, now what happens? We're trying to get that arm to sink into that plane, so here we go. It's rotating out, then the arm rotates out, and everything follows through in that same plane of rotation. So it all starts with having that heel contact uh, and that uh, stacking of the head over the pelvis during that forward move. Uh, it's a little bit easier to see from a side angle now, this brings up an interesting point about Nate Pearson. I'm just gonna play the, the clip first. So what a lot of you might notice as he moves forward is that he's not doing the whole vertical shin thing that a lot of pitching coaches will talk about. So that initial weight shift, it gets the center of mass going. So he is gaining, he's gaining uh, ground forward towards the target. You can see that just where his center of mass goes relative to the camera. So center of mass goes from right around here to something like that at peak leg lift. So he's shifting forward well. But now what does he do? As he comes into his, his hinge position, he's actually, he's not like this. So a lot, of, a lot of coaches will cue that position, but depending on your hip anatomy, depending on your structure and what works best for you, this is kind of that opposite position that, that we'll talk about, which is more of an internal rotation dominant uh, drive position. Uh, for some athletes like this, uh, they'll actually even turn that, that toe in slightly to set that angle. Uh, this is personally what works for, worked for me really well in college. Um, however, to do this, it typically requires very good hip internal rotation to be able to get in more of this position during the drive versus being more of a vertical shin guy like that. So Nate Pearson's a good example of a hard thrower. There's examples of hard throwers in both categories. Um, the idea, if you haven't read our article on this, is that it's somewhat dictated based upon your hip anatomy um, and what, what works best for you. If you're a guy who's not sure uh, kind of what works best for you, then you can split test this. You can um, try to be a little bit more of that internal rotation dominant angle, and you can also test more of a vertical shin angle and see what works best for you as far as velocity, command, feel, everything like that. So as he's moving forward down the mound, he's in that hinge, right? The pelvis is coiled over top of the femur. Okay, so there's a, there's a coiling action of the pelvis over the femur, and he's holding that coil as he moves forward. So during this linear move, he's finding the rear glute, he's coiling into the rear glute, we call this the rotational hinge. So he, you can tell the angle of the pelvis is significantly turned over the femur. This isn't even, uh, 
this isn't even with, uh, with third base. He's, he's very counter-rotated with the pelvis over this femur, which is angled that way. And that's creating this uh, coiling action into the hip rotators, into the, the rear glute. He's holding that during the linear move, holding it, holding it, holding it, holding it. You can see the belt buckle is still facing this way. Holding it, holding it, holding it, holding it. Now it starts to go. Now the pelvis starts to rotate. And you can see the belt buckle uncoil from here into landing. So right about when the foot gets here, he starts to unload the pelvis. Um, what you'll sometimes see athletes that try to open up the pelvis too early is that that belt buckle starts to open up. They start to swing the gait, the very first move outside of, out of leg lift versus riding that linear move as long as they can hold it, riding that rotational hinge as long as they can hold it, and then letting that rotation happen and snap down into landing. Okay, so again, when we talk about down into landing, it's this idea that you're not just opening the pelvis this way, but you're opening the pelvis at more of a, a, a downwards vector that matches the ultimate plane of rotation of the shoulders. So you can also think of this as like rotating down from above where the foot lands from here versus scooting into landing like this. However you want to think about it, this is the move right there. Rotating the pelvis late and down into landing. He's ending up maybe 45 degrees open with the pelvis at landing, something like that. So very efficient uh, pelvic unloading example and just interesting in that he's more of an internal rotation dominant guy as far as his back leg drive position. The next thing to talk about is his compact arm action or, or the arm spiral, the action that his arm takes. Um, something that we'll see with, with our taller guys um, who throw hard is that a lot of them benefit from actually shortening up that arm path. Uh, not necessarily getting into, you know, uh, a crazy uh, degree of elbow flexion, but basically in the, in the arm swing. So let's see if we can get a good angle of that right here. Okay, so that's a pretty good angle. So when you're dealing with guys that have extremely long wingspans, I don't know his wingspan, I'm assuming it's somewhere in the six foot six to six foot nine range. He clearly has long arms, he's a tall guy. Um, keeping that elbow bent closer to 90 degrees during that arm swing, and you can see that right there, is that he doesn't, he doesn't fully extend the arm down here behind him, like a lot, of, uh, a lot of pitchers do, is he keeps that a little bit shorter. And for really, really tall guys, that tends to help them uh, repeat that release point a little bit easier and get that arm in, in the plane of rotation a little bit easier just by shortening that up. So they're, they're dealing with very, very long levers. So making that a little bit more compact is a very, very uh, common tweak that we will use with, with our taller guys. Uh, and test and, and see if that has a beneficial effect. And a lot of times it does. So when we talk about being a little bit more compact, what we're not talking about is tensing up the arm to where you cut off that scap retraction. So you'll notice he's still creating plenty of retraction behind the body. He's still getting that arm up and back very, very well. So he's staying loose and relaxed through the pec, through the chest, and he's letting that arm spiral up and around. in a very nice and smooth path right there. So he's relaxing and floating the arm up the staircase, but he's doing so while maintaining as close as he can to uh, a more compact elbow flexion angle. So he still ends up around 90 degrees, give or take, but he's not getting this super long, inefficient, uh, exaggerated arm path to get there. So that's just something important for, for taller guys who are watching this to, to understand is it might be worth playing with that tweak and trying to keep that arm closer to 90 degrees during the actual arm swing, during the arm path itself, uh, as you spiral that arm up into position. But in doing so, you're trying to maintain a, a floating action or a relaxation of the, the anterior side of the shoulder uh, as you spiral your way up that staircase. So I'll play that one more time, just so you can see how compact he stays on the backside. And there's a good angle of it. So compact arm action, uh, something uh, relatively uh, unique to Nate Pearson. Uh, a lot of guys aren't nearly that compact, um, but it can work out very well for taller guys or guys who have trouble sinking the arm up into the plane of rotation. Joe Kelly is another great example of a, of a pitcher who he kind of reinvented his career going from that long, uh, less efficient arm spiral to a little bit more compact and getting that into the plane of rotation. Okay, 
another interesting thing about Nate Pearson is that he said that Nolan Ryan was kind of his idol and, and one of his mechanical uh, you know, models growing up. Uh, that, was, that was in one of the broadcasts that, uh, that I watched. Um, and so you can definitely see that if you watch Nate Pearson's mechanics. And then we go over here and watch, watch Nolan Ryan. Okay, so there are definitely some similarities between how he's transitioning out of his leg lift into that compact arm action that we just mentioned and how Nolan Ryan similarly keeps that elbow flexion angle. Again, a little hard to tell, but he keeps that elbow flexion angle pretty close to 90 degrees as he spirals that arm up and around. So you can definitely see some similarities here um, and see that influence of Nolan Ryan on uh, Nate Pearson's mechanics. But what I wanted to do here is talk about the fact that both of them have a uh, very high level of uh, intensity uh, or, or intent to throw the ball through the, you know, through the catcher or throw the crap out of the ball. Uh, rotational violence, however you want to describe that word, uh, since some, some uh, coaches don't like the word intent. Um, but let's listen to both of them, and you'll be able to hear both of them grunt um, as they release the pitch. So clearly putting a, a maximum effort into the throw. So here's Nolan Ryan. So there's Nolan Ryan. Uh, you might not be able to hear it. Definitely listen carefully here. Looking for his first strikeout. He hasn't been able to get track through anybody yet. Pitch inside. So we'll, uh, we'll pump up the volume there if it's not clear on the video. But uh, anyway, just another sign that both of, them, both of them are trying to throw a true 100%. It's not a you know, cruising 85% thing. And, and obviously there are some pitchers that can throw hard and seemingly throw at, at low intensities and it's smooth and easy. Um, but when you start getting into the 100 mile an hour plus range, most of them are really trying to throw the crap out of the ball. Um, however, the point that I want to make here is the properly timed intent aspect. So it's not just about that intent to throw the crap out of the ball, it's about when do you add that intensity and from where. So you can tell that he's allowing that throw to build from the lower half. We talk about this idea of, of allowing the throw to build its way up the chain and not taking over with the arm action too soon. So he's allowing the throw to build from the lower half. The upper half stays totally relaxed at this point. He's staying stacked with the head over the pelvis. He's coiling into the rear glute. He, again, he has that pelvis coiled over the femur. Um, so he's holding that coil and moving forward. The arm is just floating at this point. That's the main thing to understand. He's not trying to throw as hard as he can right here. He's letting himself get into positions. He's building tension in the rear hip. He uncoils that through the pelvis. He's still not trying to throw hard at this point. Right? It only wait, he waits until that energy spirals its way up and he gets that reflexive stretch through the pec. Now he starts bringing the electricity at the end of the throw. So the point being, it's properly timed intent. He doesn't add his arm into the throw until this point right here where he gets that, that stretch through the pec, through the lat. Now he actively contracts to add to that stretch shortening cycle. And from here to here, he's closing the gap as fast as he can. He's ripping through with his front side obliques. He's ripping through with his pec, with his lat. He's blocking on the lead leg. So very, very important example. When, when coaches say throw with intent, um, you have to be very, very careful because for one athlete that might help and for another athlete that might ruin their sequencing and lead to that arm adding into the throw too soon or muscling up. Um, so he has high level of rotational violence or intent, but he's properly timing it and properly sequencing it and not bringing the arm into the throw too soon. The next piece of information that's, that's interesting to me about Nate Pearson's mechanics is the uh, extreme degree of uh, torso extension, trunk extension, uh, you know, releasing out front, however you want to look at it, it's his ability to get so far out over his front leg at ball release. Um, this is something where there's a common misconception that to get to this position, you need to actively try to reach uh, with your arm into ball release. This is where you know, people will put like a bucket down here and do towel drills and try to hit the bucket as a way to kind of fake their way to uh, extension out front. But if you understand how the body works to load and unload that, uh, that rotational energy, this is actually a, this is a byproduct of having a, a well-sequenced throw and a well-sequenced unload to where he's not trying to get out here. Right? He, might think he, he might think he's trying if you ask him, but what he's really doing is coiling into the hip, holding that as long as possible, staying closed with the upper half at landing, getting a good lead leg block. And then from this point right here, the throw has already happened. From here, it's just an unload. Um, there's not, not much you can do at this point to really control what's happening in the throw. 
And so this is a this is a rotational catapulting or vaulting of the torso over the front side at this point as a result of getting into proper positions here. So the torso is catapulted over the front side at this point as he rotates. And so that's why he's ending up in this uh, very, very extended uh, release point out front. Obviously that's gonna make his pitches look uh, even harder than they are if he's getting, you know, however much extension he is here compared to the average thrower. So obviously that's gonna look even faster than it is coming in 102, it's gonna look like 105 plus. Um, so that's another huge advantage for a guy, uh, you know, this tall with this type of uh, extension out front. So another interesting point um, to make is that there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of hard throwers who are really, really tall, have long arms who do this. So, you know, my hypothesis is that this has something to do with the length of the arms as well. This is Archimedes Comanero. This is a clip of him with the Pirates, I believe, from a couple of years ago. Um, but what you'll see with guys with extremely long arms is that they tend to, uh, they tend to, obviously, they're longer levers, so these guys tend to be a little bit more bent over and a little bit more extended through the trunk at ball release, and they hold on to the ball for a lot longer than somebody with shorter arms. So Archimedes Comanero, he lets that throw build. Again, you see similar positions. That, that peck is relaxed, it's well sequenced intent. Now he's rotating with electricity, but he gets way out front, just like Nate Pearson. Uh, again, both guys with super long arms. Um, so I think it might have something to do as well with just having longer levers, being a taller guy. Um, you're typically gonna see guys way more out front at ball release than you know, the, the five foot eight version of Nate Pearson. So just an interesting observation there. But again, the point here is that trunk extension is a byproduct of sequencing the, uh, the start of the throw properly. It's not something that you try to force by artificially just reaching out as far as you can at the last second. So when a coach says, get on top of the ball, get out front of the ball, um, usually those are pretty awful cues because the athlete yanks open the front side and he just takes that ball and tries to reach it out as far as he can versus what we know is letting that energy wind its way up into the arm uh, naturally in a well-sequenced throw. And then the final thing that's uh, you know, already somewhat obvious is that um, part of the reason he throws so hard is because of his large frame and his genetics. Um, it's, it's a lot of things that have to go right to throw 104 miles an hour, so obviously some of that is mechanical efficiency, right? This is just a good angle of showing his, his release, um, you know, showing the fact that he does rotate into release and get that arm perfectly in plane with the shoulders. Um, but it's one of those things where you put these mechanics on a less athletic, less explosive, less powerful athlete, and maybe they top out at 92, with the exact same sequencing, exact same genetics, um, but just not being nearly as good of an athlete as Nate Pearson. So you can't just always look at guys who throw 102 miles an hour, 103 miles an hour, and say, you know, it's purely because of their mechanics. Yes, they tend to have relatively efficient mechanics because you're not gonna throw 103 without having some sort of mechanical efficiency, but it's not as simple as saying, hey, everybody has to throw like this guy and you're all gonna throw 104 miles an hour. We all intuitively know that the frame, the genetics, um, you know, the power output, the mobility, uh, all these things are variables that ultimately affect uh, the output. That doesn't mean that we can't train a lot of those variables. Obviously, he's trained to a significant extent a lot of these variables. He threw 94 coming into college. Uh, he left college throwing 102. So there's obviously a lot of, uh, of these variables that can be trained, can be improved over time with the right approach um, and optimizing mechanics. So again, mechanics is just one piece of that, um, but it would be ignorant to not, uh, you know, not admit that his genetics and his frame and his, his lever length uh, plays a key role in his ability to throw 104 miles an hour. So if you guys enjoyed this mechanical analysis, enjoyed this video, we do offer a service that does this. We will break down your footage and rank you on 55 to 60 different mechanical variables that we look for in high level throwers. We will identify your limiting factors and put you up on the touch screen break down everything, and then we'll hop on a call to explain everything and identify a plan moving forward. If you're interested in that, make sure to send us an email and we will get you more information.